People seem to have liked my Android on GSM phone video quite a bit, so here's another one. The 80s. Back then, laptops were rather odd-looking. Strange displays, strange form factors. Not so much this one. This is a Compaq 286 laptop from the uh, end of the 80s. And as you can tell from the form factor, this look looks quite much like a normal laptop. Of course, the color is not really up to date. Uh, this is a typical 80s beige, but uh, form factor wise, it's pretty much a standard laptop already. Uh, standard keyboard and also, well, or rather big screen, uh, big uh, display. This also displays uh, graphics, so it's rather advanced for a portable computer. All right. Then. Let's power it up. So, here it goes. Takes a while to boot. First does some memory checks. Uh, 640k of memory. Of course, nobody needs more than that. Floppy is uh, trying to boot. There's no disk in there, so it starts from the hard drive. And as you can see, we have here the standard uh, Linux boot up uh, shell. Scrolling through all the messages, uh, let's wait for a boot prompt. Should appear any minute. And now we can look in. So it's a normal bash you can see here. We also have uh, Wi-Fi, so we can surf the internet. Let's do that. For example, we can go to Google. There you have a Google prompt. Let's enter, for example, the name of my blog and search for that. And as you can see here, first entry is actually my blog. So that works quite nicely. What else can we do? So um, we could uh, do, for example, some development uh, using um, an editor and uh, Python or something like that. Um, but of course, just having a small screen like this uh, is not that handy. So we can split the screen using Tmux. Uh, so, again, one simple shell, and we can split that into two shells. So, we have now here two shells. We can do an Alice on the one side and can start an editor on the other side. It works all pretty nicely. And um, yeah, so I would say it's almost usable. So if you're doing mostly uh, console work, then well, you can do something with it. Um, of course, that's not all. We have here uh, extension port and we can, for example, connect HDMI. And as you can tell, we have here now a window manager. You can also plug in a USB device and control everything as we are used to. So, yeah, actually kind of usable. So, um, of course, uh, as you saw uh, in the title, it says installing Linux into a 286 laptop and that into is actually the trick that makes this thing running here. If you look here into the side, uh, you see there's a Raspberry Pi Zero and that's basically running the whole show, show here. There's no deeper secret uh, involved to that, but uh, yeah, that's basically the 
thing that I wanted to show you. And you might uh, say, yeah, this is uh, nonsense, and you're absolutely right, this, uh, there's no point uh, to this, um, except from looking what cool, retro, stylish uh, on the terminal. But uh, actually, there is another motivation why I actually installed this in here, uh, and that is transferring files to the original 286 machines. So as you uh, can see, the only way of putting files in there is floppy drive, and that's of course not really that comfortable, um, because yeah, you have to write the floppies, and um, that's a bit awkward these days. And with the uh, Raspberry installed here, I can simply copy files wirelessly onto the Raspberry Pi, and then transfer them from the Raspberry Pi onto the 286 machine. And this, what you're seeing here, is actually just the terminal emulator that connects to the Raspberry Pi. But I can, uh, of course, quit uh, this terminal emulator. And now I'm back in the uh, standard DOS environment and I can easily copy files in here. I can even uh, connect to the internet uh, via this uh, Raspberry Pi from DOS itself, which feels a bit odd, but yeah, as you can see, here's for example a ping.exe, so I can could launch pings uh, from that, I rarely do that, but it's possible, so this is also quite fun to do. Okay, let's open this thing up. <laughs> it's rather easy to do, I already removed the screws, so just lift this and now you can see the insides of this machine. Um, so we have here floppy drive, um, hard drive, this is the uh, main PCB with the processor on it and um, if we lift that up we see here below the I.O. PCB. And, um, yeah, so the secret ingredient is of course this here, Raspberry Pi Zero, which is connected to the I.O. PCB here, uh, to the serial port. And this way they can both can exchange uh, their data, and this is what makes everything tick here. So it's rather simple. This setup, the addition of the Raspberry Pi uh, is rather simple, but uh, getting this whole thing to run was not. And uh, the reason for that was a uh, capacitor plague. So as you can see here, I replaced uh, most of the electrolytic capacitors because they uh, were starting uh, to leak quite badly. And um, yeah, I don't know, roughly 20 uh, capacitors or so I swapped, but that wasn't enough because uh, the electrolyte from the insides of the capacitors was already on the PCB and it started to dissolve the tracks. And it I've never seen uh, anything as bad as this machine because, uh, I don't know, probably again around 20 traces I needed to rewire. You see some uh, signs of this here. So it started off with a simple keyboard uh, uh, controller error. So I think this trace here fixed that. And then it went on and on. Then uh, on the display, uh, the, some lines were missing. Um, so uh, a line from the GPU, from the uh, controller to the memory was broken. And um, with these multi-layer PCBs, it's often not that easy to, f to find the flaws because uh, yeah, the traces maybe start at the top and then they vanish into some inner layers and you don't know where they end up. So you cannot simply look by eye where they uh, go to. And one trick I used was um, here, this old relay. I uh, had some kind of copper brush here and um, I used this to brush the PCB um, with a continuity tester connected to it. And this way, whenever I was in the proximity of uh, the connection I was looking for, 
started to beep because the brush made contact. And this is, of course, much easier than testing all pads individually. So this is a rather nice trick, uh, might be useful for you as well. Yes, then after reverse engineering the GPU to find uh, the missing connection, this worked. Um, next problem was, uh, of course, the battery here was dead. And so I bought a new one, swapped it in, and uh, apparently these machines, uh, they need to have a, a BIOS initialization. So they won't boot up unless you have initialized the BIOS. So of course you can download uh, the floppy drive. I put it in here in the floppy drive and the next bad thing happened and uh, the belt of the floppy drive perished. So of course, no problem. I bought a replacement belt, they are available, but you can only replace the belt if you remove the top head of the floppy. So I did that and with that, of course, I lost the alignment of the head to the disc. And this is rather delicate because uh, the heads need to be aligned within 100 micrometers or below, below that a bit. So uh, it's pretty tough and I don't have the tools or uh, yeah, the setup to do this properly. So what I did was I roughly aligned the head, screwed it in just a bit so that it's not uh, loose. And then I had a special disc that uh, just showed me an error message when whenever uh, the, the track uh, of the top head was not found. And I could simply pre press spacebar and it would tell me uh, immediately whether it was successful or not. And so I tried it, pressed spacebar, and if it was unsuccessful, I gave the head a tiny bump with a screwdriver. Tried again, tiny bump, tried again, tiny bump, yada yada. And uh, at one point I found the right alignment. This is rather brute force, but it worked. So it's not perfectly aligned because um, this floppy now won't uh, except all uh, disks. So I have a USB, a floppy drive, and uh, the, this drive here is not so happy with the, uh, disks written on this uh, USB floppy drive, but I have another uh, drive and this uh, is happily accepting the disks. So then I could uh, load the BIOS disk, write the BIOS uh, memory, initialize the BIOS, and then I could for the first time boot into the hard disk. And what was uh, the issue there? Of course, the hard disk was not working. And what I had to do, uh, I had to open up the hard disk and uh, kind of free up uh, the joints of the uh, actuator, uh, the bearings, uh, also the platter, and there was also some dirt. Where I removed that, and after that, it booted happily into the original uh, operating system that was on there. Actually, it uh, belonged to some uh, uh, yeah, car carpenter, I think, and uh, he was doing his um, invoice management with this laptop. So that was kind of a nice <laughs> look into the history of this machine. Yeah, so this was a rather long journey to get this machine running again. But um, to be honest, it was mostly frustrating, but also quite fun in the end, because I got it running properly. So yeah, that's my little uh, flashback to the 80s. And yeah, my quite uh, yeah, pointless <laughs> project. But like I said, it's just for fun. And um, the result is quite nice, I think. All right. Thanks for watching and see you soon. Bye.